Good morning. We're really excited about this. I'm really excited about this, the, uh, this presentation. You know, some of you remember, many of you remember, a couple of years ago we, we filmed a little video that we showed everybody and it had me and marshmallows and juggling and, and we thought we'd, we'd not do any marshmallows or juggling this year. But we're going to talk about, uh, spend a little time together this morning, kind of setting a groundwork, getting everybody on the same page, and, uh, and I'm quite looking forward to it. So putting it all together, the Granite Way. You know, work with me for just a minute here. We've got a bell curve over here, but think of that bell curve and, and where people might sit on that curve. And let's think about the American Revolution Bostonians in 1777. So there were the patriots. These were the, these were the folks who, they wanted revolution, they wanted to be free, they were gung-ho, they were willing to lay down their lives and move forward and, and, and move this, this agenda, the give, give me liberty or give me death kind of agenda. Then there were the Loyalists, or the Tories, and these were the folks, they liked, they liked the king, they, they'd, they'd always you know, been loyal subjects, and they're going to stay loyal, and they really, really resented and looked down their noses, perhaps, at these, at these rebels and rabble-rousers and, and so on. And, and uh, you know, so you, those are probably on the two ends of the spectrum. You got the one group on the one end of the spectrum, the other group on the other end of the spectrum, but the bulk of the folks, I believe, in 1777, were those who were kind of watching, they're kind of keeping their heads down to see which side's going to win. You know, I'm really trying to make a living and keep my family fed and, and so on. We'll think about that in the bell curve for just a minute. Now let's go to the Ukraine. I suspect in the Ukraine there's something very similar going on. There are the Ukrainians, right? So you got a piece of this bell curve here. They are, oops, and you got on the other side, the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's the pro-Russians. And they feel really strongly one way or they feel really strongly the other way. And then the bulk of the people there, I think are those kind of watching to see which side wins because they don't really care. They're just trying to live, trying to survive. Well, let's, let's use this metaphor, this analogy, or this bell curve, and let's talk about Granite School District educators in 2014. We've got a bell curve. And on the one on the one leg, the one end of the bell curve, we've got some folks who are the granite way all the way. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, they're really excited about that. They've jumped into this 100% or 130% or whatever. Then we've got some other folks who are fighting for the good old non-aggression pact days. You know when, when people left you alone and you could do your own thing and, and they you know, there might have been an end of the year assessment, so on, the, the geez, what do we call them, the SATs or whatever back then, that, but they really didn't go anywhere and they, and, and they really didn't mean much. And, and so this, this new day that we're in with these new kids that learn different and these parents who want to be involved and in your business and these administrators and legislators who really don't know what's going on, they're all, you know, can we go back to those good old non-aggression pack days where I don't cause you trouble and you leave me alone. And then you got, then we've got a group in the middle who are kind of watching, you know, they get the value of this, they see it. And they look at their, they look at their peers who are fighting on that other end of the spectrum and they're saying, you know, I really don't want to get in anybody's way here. Um, I'm really in this for the kids. I think there's something to be said there, and we can we can reflect on on where we are. Interestingly, when you think about when you think about the American Revolution, you know ultimately the 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 war ended, and it's not that the loyalists all moved away, um, you know, but but the but the group came together, everybody came together and moved forward, and we've and we've developed we've had a couple hundred years of really really a great country, really a great country. Think about this a little bit. Okay, it's clear, it's clear to me that everything's about the classroom teacher. That's really where the work gets done, where the real work gets done. 
Um, you know, principals, principals do a lot of real work and, and the district does a lot of work too, but, but the business that we're in, the work that we really do, which is changing children's lives, that's directly done by the teachers. It's all about the classroom teacher. Teachers, interestingly, I don't, I don't think anybody gets a check from the school they're in. Teachers, in a very real way, are the representatives of the school district. You're assigned to each student. Teachers set the tone in the classroom. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Teachers set the tone in the classroom. Teachers set the tone with the parents. Teachers set the tone with the in the neighborhood. Teachers set the tone at the grocery store when they're talking to people around them and say, how's, how's work? Oh, I love my job. I love teaching children. I touch the future. I teach. I shape the future. Those, or sometimes there are other messages that, that we as educators set. Teachers set the tone. Teachers provide information about everything that's going on. Certainly, certainly in teaching and instructing the kids. But they also provide information, again, to parents and, and to families and to neighborhoods and on and on. Teachers provide vision and direction. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. This is what we're trying to achieve. Interestingly, I talked with the, all the administrators um, a couple of weeks ago, and I gave a very similar presentation, but I said to the principals, I said to the building administrators, that a lot of this is about you. So teachers, as we go through this, please, by all means, hold your principal accountable for doing all of these things as well to help you and to support you that you can perform that you can do your role, that you can fill your role as well. Teachers provide motivation, as do administrators provide motivation. But again, as far as the actual work that a school district, that a school, that an education system does, it's about the teacher. Teachers reward that goes along closely with motivation. Probably, perhaps, the greatest reward that teachers give is, is that knowledge, are those building blocks, it's that thinking, it's that learning. That's the greatest reward. Thank you so much. So, um, some of you may be aware, have heard of Prosperity 2020 and Education First, which are a couple of groups, and Envision Utah has an education agenda, and there are lots of organizations that have education agendas, the, the, or that are developing agendas. The Govern, Governor's um, Excellence in Education Commission has an education agenda. Well, the legislature decided they needed to have an education agenda as well, and so for a couple of years now, there's been a legislative education task force that invites people in to come and speak. And, and answer their questions. Well, I was invited to speak, and they sent me the questions that they wanted to ask ahead of time. And it was specifically, their, their questions were specifically directed towards principals, but at a previous meeting, the same questions had been asked regarding teachers. So look at these, look at these questions and, and, and put yourself in the mindset for a minute of where our legislature is. Here are the questions they wanted us to, to address. How do we better prepare educators? Well, that's, that's kind of in the preparation program kind of question. That's a good question. How do we better evaluate educators? Well, I know there's lots of thoughts there, and, and, and we've worked really closely with the Granite Education Association to develop our PG&E, and boy, I'm grateful to them for the work that they've done there and, and the work that we continue to do in evaluating educators. But look at this last question. How do we better get rid of educators who aren't performing? Well, so these are the questions I'm asked. And um, this last one, let me tell you how, how we approached that last one, because it's not about getting rid of people. It's been really, and this is the way, the way I addressed that, it's been really heartening the last couple of years in our interviews both with administrators, administrative candidates, as well as with teacher candidates. We hear things like, I want to work in your district because I know what you believe in, and I believe in those same things. I believe in that too. I want to be part of Granite because I know what you believe in. I, I do too. Granite's got tools. 
that they, that they use, that I want to use as I practice this profession. We're hearing this from administrative candidates and from teacher candidates, really heartening. Now, let me tell you, in terms of administrative appointments, the ones we've made the last couple of years, we've really looked for people whose personal vision aligns with the district vision, with the district direction and the board vision and direction. This granite, uh, people, who's, people who have already embraced the Granite Wave philosophy, who are on board with that already. Now I want you to know our principals are currently hiring teachers who also embrace that same vision and philosophy. Okay, for the next couple of minutes, I want to walk through a, a historical situation, the Battle of Gettysburg, and, and I, draw, I want to draw an analogy that has application um, to us. So, so bear with me here and try and, try, and, try and guess ahead of time, where is he going with this? So here we are. Battle of Gettysburg, um, there's something about the perspective of this event that I think really, really does have application to us in our, in our various roles. So real quick, July 2nd, 1863, there's the 20th Maine Regiment. This is a National Guard Regiment. These are not full-time Army folks, um, but they had to get to Gettysburg, and so in five days they marched 100 miles to get, get where they were going. There's a Colonel Vincent, and um, outside of Gettysburg there's, there's a couple of hills, and Little Round Top was undefended. And so here, come, here comes the Confederate Army and, and General Lee and all those, and so, so uh, Colonel Vincent moves his brigade into a defensive position and he calls Colonel Chamberlain, who was, by the way, a, we'll get back to that, he was a teacher, but Colonel Chamberlain um, is told for the 20th Maine, Colonel, you've got the end of this line. You've got to protect it at all costs. You've got to hold this ground because if they get around behind us, everything's over. The, the battles so you've got to hold this line at all costs not let anybody through so Chamberlain puts his people together like this so here's the 83rd Pennsylvania regiment and the 20th Maine lines up right here and there's a big rock it's called the boulder and so he lines up here um, his people are anchored up on the boulder and uh, and that's where they are they're too deep now, almost immediately, they're attacked. And so, so they, they fight and they fight and they throw back the attack and they throw back the attack and they throw back the attack. But Colonel Chamberlain's watching and he sees another group coming this way, coming up the, coming up the, uh, up the flank. And so he thinks, oh my goodness, how I've got, to, I've got to stop that. So he takes the back rank of folks, of his, of his soldiers, about 200 soldiers, and gets them here in line there on this line and so but he can't let these guys know that he's just weakened the line by taking half of them out so they keep the firing going and they keep going and uh, and they all get into this position here now that movement that falling from there and moving over to there for those 200 people that's not something they would practiced before this is not a, a movement that they drilled um, they're not in the rule. It, these, his guys probably had no idea why they were doing what it was they were doing until they got there and started, um, and started engaging this group that was coming. But he stressed the importance of the mission to his people, to his folks. He showed his troops what it was that needed to be done. He worried about them. He had to be fast and creative and nimble. He analyzed the specific situation, and they, they were able to get there um, immediately without even letting the other folks who were attacking them know that anything was going on. So then, they started to run out of ammunition. And so he did another thing, which had never been done before. I mean, it's in all the books now. It's in all of the tactics and strategies books now. But it, it was not before then. He had these guys... That were, that were lined here, even though, I mean, they didn't have walkie-talkies, they didn't have Bluetooth, they weren't in communication other than hand signals that they had practiced, but this was something they'd never done before. These guys, they swung that way, they fixed bayonets, this gets kind of bloody, I mean, it was a bloody, it was a war, after all, so they fixed bayonets, they swung to here, and then they kept going, and these guys fell in behind them, and they charged along the whole line, and drove 
drove everybody out. And be, as they came down through here, and it was a hill, right? So they had, they had, uh, they were running downhill, which is, which is an advantage. But these were things that had never been done before. They were not in anybody's playbook. <laughs> Nobody had gone to college and studied, studied this kind of a maneuver, but quite frankly, uh, I'll, go, I'll go forward. General Lee was never so close to victory, I mean completely, as, as that day. Um, this regiment, they captured 400 prisoners, hundreds of dead enemies. It's a tribute to the discipline of this unit. 358 farmers, uh, woodsmen, fishermen, some casualties. There's never a greater leader. I mean, we still talk about Colonel Chamberlain. Now, he was a seminary graduate, so not seminary like, like we do seminary today, but he was, he was, he'd studied religion, and a year before the battle, he'd been a language professor. So again, they did something they'd never done before, that they'd not been trained in doing, but it was, so what, what were the, what were the characteristics, what, what were, why did this work? What did Chamberlain do? That, what did he do long ahead of time that made this work? So think about this. Think about ourselves now. Chamberlain knew what the objectives were and he knew what his role was. He knew what his mission was. Defend this. Defend this line. Don't let them get past you. Chamberlain could communicate with and inspire his troops. And his troops trusted him. Teachers, you can expect this kind of leadership from your principals, from your administrators. Expect it from them. And administrators, provide this kind of leadership. Know what the objectives are. Know what the role is. And if it's not clear because I haven't communicated well, then find out. Know what our mission is. Communicate with and inspire the teachers. Communicate with, now teachers, communicate with and inspire your students. Let them know what the mission is, what the objectives are, what the role is, what it is that's going on and build this trust. Build this trust. Now, Chamberlain did not say, everybody hunker down, I'll do what I can to shelter you from what the district wants you to do. We would not be the same place today, the same United States of America today, if, uh, if, that, had been, if that had been a strategy. Principals, I expect more of you than this. Teachers, I, I look forward to you being leaders in your classrooms and going this direction rather than, than another direction. I don't know that everybody knows when, there is, when, there, when people want to travel in the district on the district's dime. They have to fill out a travel request form and in that travel, it's almost a proposal. You're writing a proposal to travel. And in those travel forms, there's, there are three questions that are asked. Um, why do we need to know this? Uh, how are you going to get better at what you do by going to this conference? And how are you going to share it with people when you get back? Well, even I do this. I, I go to two conferences. Um, one, I go with the, with the Board of Education. They take me with them to their conference. And then I also go to the superintendent's conference. The board sends me to that one. So I'd like to share with all of you some of the highlights that come, that I've, I've gleaned this last, really this last year, from attending these conferences. So that's National School Boards Association, the Superintendent Association. All of the keynote speakers, every keynote speaker in both of these conferences this past year addressed the need to resist the sell-off of our public schools. And we said, well, sell-off of our public schools, that doesn't make any sense. What, it, what, is, what does that mean? Well, there's this progression, there's this, there's this agenda, and we've, we've talked in the, in the past about about some different agendas, some anti-public education agendas perhaps. And the steps that they take, I mean, we've, it's, it's happened in Louisiana, it's happened in, in Florida, um, Kansas, um, Nebraska, Washington State. I mean, we can, we can go on and on, those are some. But first there's a grading law that goes in place and that, that grades schools, A, B, C, D, F. And then and then there's an evaluation law that comes into place where people are evaluated certain ways. And then the, the, the last piece to this puzzle is either a parent trigger law or a state takeover law. We'll get back to that in just a second. Um, if a school gets a C, D, or F, then the state or the, 
or, or uh, parents can come in and say, we want to take the school over and run the school ourselves. But what run the school ourselves really means is we hire a private management company to come take the school over. So which, and that's then how, how the public funds start going towards the private sector to these private schools where they have no, no obligation to, to retain any kinds of contracts. They're not connected to, um, to, to the curriculum. But the upside of this is that the management company starts making a lot of money that they're not making now. The conversations in Utah really go towards this parent trigger um, direction. And I, I really expect to see legislation proposed to, to put a parent trigger law in place. But that really, that really works towards selling off our public schools. And folks, if I've not told you this before, I, I will resist and fight as long as I can this concept of a multi-tiered system of, of public education that, that, that this group of people somehow deserves a better education than this group of people. That there's a group of haves and a have-nots. and There's some kind of a perpetuation of a soft aristocracy. We can't have that. We cannot have that. That's not, that, that'll be the end, that'll be the end of everything. Now I'm getting melodramatic. But in a lot of ways it's true. We've got to have an education system that's open to all, regardless of what they come to school with, regardless of what they bring. It's hard, but it's what'll keep us alive and vibrant and, and successful as a country. We're gonna fight this. Also from these conferences, the way to beat the private sector incursion is to embrace accountability. We think we're doing this better. I mean, look, look around you, don't literally look around you or raise your hands. But who thinks we do it better than the charter schools or the private schools? Do we do it better than the charter schools and the private schools? You bet we do. I believe that. I absolutely believe that of every one of you. So if we think we're doing better, if you believe that too, then we've got to prove it, is a message from these conferences. Here's an interesting thought. In our hyper-connected world, it really doesn't matter what we know whether we're a teacher or, or it doesn't really matter what we know what matter because Google knows everything and everybody's got access to Google what matters is what we do with what we know what is our contribution so we've all we got the knowledge what's our contribution with the knowledge what are we doing with that how are we how are what are we doing with children to contribute there to make that grow a, a, an interesting speaker in one of our in in one of these uh, keynote addresses, suggested that we should think like immigrants, that we should be paranoid optimists. The United States, okay, an immigrant thinks the U.S. is the, is the country with the most opportunity in the world. Let's go there. Um, but you know what? Things can get taken away pretty quickly. There are most opportunities there, but we've got to protect what we've got. There's no legacy spot for an immigrant. An immigrant has to, an immigrant's always thinking, how do I, how do I um, maintain, build on, grow this, this great opportunity that I have? And you know what, as administrators and as teachers, we need to be thinking the same way. You know, this, this idea of tenure and stuff like that, um, we cannot just sit here, we can't sit in the same place we've always sat and expect that everything's going to be the same way that it's always been. Things not only are changing, but they have changed. There's no legacy spot. Think like an immigrant. Think like an artisan. This one's kind of touching. Let's create a product. Let's teach in such a way, just frankly, that people want it. It's so superior, they want to come to our classroom. Be proud, figuratively of course, but so proud of our work that we want to carve our initials in it so that everybody knows this is one of my kids. This is a kid that I've worked with. Look at this, look at this and how proud I am of that, of what we've accomplished together. Always be in beta mode. I know that rubs folks wrong. I get it. But we should never feel like we're finished. Never feel like, okay, we've achieved, we've arrived, we're done. We don't need to worry about it anymore. We've got everything floating, all's under control. No, we can never think that we're finished. We've always got to be learning, always got to be growing. 
I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get nasty emails from some of you on this point. You're, we're I, I get it. I do. We need to be part of a culture of continuous improvement. Always improving. Always growing. Always learning. I like that. Who likes being stale? Nobody likes being stale. Let's always be thinking this way. Think like a parent. Our individual kids, our kids, are our most valued possessions. Value these kids. Think like a waitress. One, the, the speaker that, that did this presentation talked about going to a restaurant and, and, uh, and asked for a bowl of fruit. And the waitress brought out this great bowl of fruit. And, and as he thought about it and as he talked with her about it, there's very little in her waitressing job that she could influence and control. But those things that she could influence and control, she took to the utmost. She was creative with um, and, 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 and made that flourish such that the customers come back, and, and this speaker did, because what she did control, she controlled to the maximum. Now folks, we do have a problem, um, and, and we're going to talk about this here for a little bit. In math, we've got a new curriculum and a new alignment that poses challenges, certainly in the elementaries, also in the junior highs, also in the high schools. All of you, as the new curriculums come in, regardless of how you feel about the standards, I, I happen to be a real, and, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, I'm a real supporter of the standards. There are things that need to be reordered and some sequences that need to be, and I get that math three is, there's an awful lot packed into math three, I, I know that. I do, but um, it's a good curriculum, but it's been making every one of us feel like a first-year teacher as we've had to relearn things. But I'll get back to some of that in just a minute. Let me give a, a, another example. Integrated science. Some years ago, I had a, had a science teacher. Now, you, many of you know, integrated science is it's these four parts, and let's see if I can do this. Biology, earth science, chemistry, and physics. And this particular teacher came in and he said, you know, you're, you got all this emphasis on, on uh, you got all this emphasis on teaching the curriculum and, and sticking with the core, but you know what? My favorite part of this class, of this course, is physics. And so I teach physics and we do physics activities and we do, and the kids love physics and the parents love the school and everything's great and everything's positive and and you know I don't get to the chemistry and the biology and the earth science because that that's not as interesting to me but the kids love physics they love science and they leave me loving science and you know what my job's to make kids love science isn't that right and I said no that's not right because the kids are gonna leave your class leave that integrated science class and they're gonna take chemistry next year or they're going to take biology next year. They're going to take that next class. And they're going to be in the room with kids who had all four parts of the course and not just the quarter of it. And so the teacher, your peer, is going to be talking with these kids in chemistry or in biology or whatever, expecting them to know, to have learned in your class what it was that was in your curriculum. But because your kids didn't learn that part, they're going to be behind. And what they're going to tell themselves is, I'm dumb at science. And it's not that they're dumb at science. They're not dumb at science. They were passed on unprepared for that next course. We can't do that to each other as teachers, nor can we do that to kids. And think about when they leave us, when they leave high school and go to college. It's the same kind of same kind of situation, same kind of thing. We've got to teach the curriculum. We've got to have that, yeah, we want to teach the kids to love the subject. That's wonderful. That is a big part of the job. But we also need to teach them the subject so they master the subject. We've made some observations. This is an elementary chart. Don't, don't look real closely at this. You've probably seen this before. All of your principals have it. On this side is the UCAS score, low to high. Down here is percentage of free and reduced lunch, uh, zero to 100. 
it's interesting, we've only got one school, maybe, maybe two schools in the whole district that have less than 10% free and reduced lunch. Think about that. And look at these, more than 90%. It's difficult to compare you know, this school with that school because the kids are different, right? But we can look at them in slices of similarly demographic, that's not a word, but, but you know what I'm saying, in slices of similarly demographic kids. And now, now let's look at this school as compared to these schools. And, and you're going to be hearing from Todd Brager here in just a couple of minutes or later on today who's going to talk about some of the statistical work that we're doing to find out what really is the difference in what's going on, what's happening or what's not happening between, between some of these schools. That's elementary. Here's junior high. There's not as many of them, so it's, it's a little bit tighter. I don't have a high school screen, um, but we have that for high school as well. We've made some observations here. Let me set the context this way. UCI, that stands for Utah System of Higher Education. Um, so kids graduate from high school in the spring. They go to college that fall. Not all of them, uh, but, but many of them. And then they, they, they're there in college for a year. And so then they have all of that data. This is what we're going to talk about. They have the data there. Um, the next, so the spring following the spring that they graduated, they crunch numbers, sort all that stuff out. And then um, Dave Bueller, the commissioner of higher ed, and I sit down and, and we look at this data together. And so they're looking, they're looking very closely at their freshmen. So the class of 2012, that's the latest data that we have. There were 3,586 Granite School District graduates that graduated from high school in the spring of 2012. Of those, 1,553, so not quite half, attended Yushi the next year, so the 12-13 school year. The data on the need for remedial math and English is staggering. Now remember, these kids had 12 or 13 years of the old math and language arts curriculum. And that's, and that's where we're going with this. And now we've got the new standards, but, but hang on. So this is, the, this is the chart that I got. This is all of Granite District students. I've got something like this um, by high school as well. Let's look at math here, okay? So, of the 1,553 kids that went to Yushi, 525 of them, actually 927 of them took math. Of those 927, more than half, more than half of the kids that took math their first year needed to take remedial math in college. And of those that took remedial math, 42% got a D or an F, 20% got a C. Language arts, quite a bit better, but a quarter of them, a quarter of those kids, needed to take remedial language arts. And of them, 40% got a C, D, or an F. This does not mean that our, that our high school teachers did a poor job. I fully believe, I sincerely believe, that the kids learned the curriculum that you taught. But what it shows is that the college pipeline, the college expectations, and the high school curriculum were not aligned. There was a misalignment. So they left our system, having had 12 or 13 years of that former curriculum, and had mastered it. But it was not what the higher ed expectation was. We've got to teach the curriculum. We've got to teach the core. And, and that gets back to, to this observation that we've made. Um, I had some teachers from Monroe Elementary who went to the National Excellence in Urban Education Symposium. And they got home from this, they got home from this, uh, this symposium, it's like the 90, 90, 90 schools or something like that. They got home from the symposium and, and they, uh, they wrote me an email. I got emails from a lot of you, but these guys wrote me an email and they said, Superintendent, um, would you come out to our school? We just went to a conference. We want to talk to you about, about some stuff. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to come out and talk to you about your conference. So I, I, I actually, yeah, I kind of went out with a bit of that attitude. And they said, 
we want to tell you what we've learned. And in their words, it was, do you know what's being taught these people in this National Excellence in Urban Education Symposium? It's the Granite Way. It's those five things that we talk about. That's what this symposium was about. So Martin, Dr. Bates, Superintendent, how can we get the word out about these? I said, well, you know, might have an opportunity this fall to get some of that word out. They were really excited. I was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was refreshing. It was re really nice to hear from them. So what we've observed in the schools, and remember the chart that we had in the, the similarly demographic schools, that in those where the teachers and the administration and everybody is bought into these five principles I'm going to point out here, those are the ones that tend to be above the line. And the ones where they're not, those are the ones that tend to be down below that in, in that particular slice. Fidelity to the core. Not to the tool, by the way, but to the core, to the objectives. Using the instructional framework, that's the, that's the instructional template, making sure that you got all the pieces, that it's a well-rounded lesson, that everything's there together. Tools and formative assessments. Boy, you're going to hear today or in the next couple of days about the research on regular and frequent formative assessments. Well, what the research shows, if all you're doing is, is um, giving the assessments, it has no impact. But if you're giving the assessments, if you're administering them, and you give the kids feedback, Achievement explodes, and even better, even better, dramatically, if you administer the assessments, give the kids feedback, and the kids then track themselves, their growth, and what they, what they you know, on a pretest, what they know now and what they don't know, and then on the post-test, again, frequent formative on this, on this post-test, they see what it is that they've learned, they start owning that, so, the research is clear. Frequent formative assessments where the kids get feedback and track themselves, there is an explosion of achievement. PLCs. We've been saying this for a long time. Um, we've got to get away, our profession's got to get away from the one-room schoolhouse. And you say, well, we don't have one-room schoolhouses. No, but we have a lot of schools that have 80 one-room schoolhouses under the same roof. We've got to get away from that. Think of the power, the power of taking these assessments and sitting down together in a group around a table as a third grade team or as a math team or, or, or you got three junior highs that get their arts people together and they sit around as a team and they look at the objectives and they say, you know what, your kids in whichever group this is, your kids sure seem to be um, learning those objectives. Can you show me how, to, how, how you've been teaching that? Or... Um, and they say, yeah, well, well let us, let me, uh, yeah, if you'll show me how you teach these other pieces and you work together, you drill down, what is it that's really going on here? Think of the power of, of uh, working in a PLC and, and, and everybody owns these kids and nobody's, see, and we've talked about this a little bit last year, those of you who, who remember, this whole performance pay thing, really the direction we're trying to take that is that it's not that you get docked if, you're, if your kid's this or that or the other, but that a team, kind of like we were just describing, a team um, sets a goal, and if they achieve the goal for their whole grade level or department or whatever that is, that everybody gets this bonus. Well, that sure, sure makes it so that I'm not trying to shove away the English language learner kids to you and the special ed kids to you so that I've got all of the you know, the accelerated kids, so I get it and nobody else does. So think of the power of PLCs when, when people are working together with the, with the right incentives, which is how do we help all of our kids learn and grow. And then MTSS, multi-tiered system of support. So the kids that just really aren't getting it, that we catch them. We identify them, we catch them, and we've got a system-wide, a school-wide, perhaps a network, but we've got a, we've got a system to catch these kids and hold them. I want to talk for just a minute about blueprints and and I've, I've shared this with some of you before so so bear with me for just a minute if you've if you've seen this before. 
Um, in terms of the objectives of the curriculum, the State Board of Education has the objective establishment authority under the Constitution of the State of Utah. Superintendents can't, superintendents can't um, write objectives for the curriculum. Uh, school boards can't, teachers can't. That's done by the State Board of Education. So, so in a very real way, in a very real way, we've contracted with the state to teach what it is they've hired us to teach, which is that, that core curriculum, if you will. So I, I want to do, do an example here. These are, these are blueprints because they're blue. But on this page in here, this is a living room. Here's a living room. I'm sure you can all see this. And here on the wall, there's some S's. S1, S2, S3. And over here on this wall, those are just symbols. It's a circle with two lines through it. Those happen to be plugs. And uh, these are the plans. This is the curriculum. And this is how it's been set up. Now sometimes, this is what we run into. So, you've designed this house, you put this blueprint together, and you go in one day to, um, to see what's going on. Because if you're smart, if you've ever remodeled or you've ever built, don't wait till the end. Go in and find out along the way how things are going. There's a lesson there. But, but do, if you're ever remodeling, you go in and make sure. So you walk in, and here's this guy, and he's got, instead of the three switches that were on the plan, he's up to like eight on two, two gangs of these. And, and the plugs aren't there. And you say, excuse me, um, you're not, the, what, what you're doing is not on the plan. Well, here's a bad answer. That electrician might say to you, there's a plan? Okay, that's not, not a good answer. Okay, same scenario. You walk in, he's putting in extra switches and not enough plugs. They're not the right plugs or plugs in the right places. And you say, um, what you're doing is not on the plan. And he looks at you and he says, you know, I saw that, but switches, switches are so much more fun than plugs. Plugs just kind of sit there. I mean, there's a plug right there. It just doesn't do anything. But switches, they turn things on and they turn things off. And you can control stuff with switch switches. Are, everybody likes switches better. Everybody likes those better. And so I'm doing what I like doing that's more fun to do and that everybody likes more. On the one hand, that's a, a, a fulfilling answer. But on the other hand, that's not a good answer either. Oh, I went too fast. I'm the expert. Same situation. You walk in and the, and the guy says, you see, you got too many switches and not enough plugs. And he looks at you and he says, do you have an electrician's license? Um, did you go to school to become an electrician? I'm the expert here. Don't talk to me about, about what the plan is. I know better. I've done this for lots of years. Um, that's a troubling answer if you're building a house or remodeling a house. That may also be a troubling answer if you're a parent and have that conversation. Oh, I did it again. You walk in, you got the plugs and the switches, and you say, I notice you're not putting in any plugs. And they said, they say to you, yeah, I saw that on the plan. This is perhaps the most troubling answer. I saw that, saw that on the plan, but in my electrical training program, they never taught me how to do plugs. So I'm putting in extra switches, hoping that that takes care of that. Now, all four of these answers, there's a plan. I'm doing what I like doing, what I'm comfortable with. Um, I'm the expert. Yeah, institutional arrogance. Or, or, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do what the plan calls for. I haven't been trained to that. Those really are all issues of professional development. All of those are professional development issues, which is something that we have a sore lack of. And which is why our Board of Education just a couple of weeks ago, uh, raised taxes. They went out on the most tenuous of political limbs 
and raise taxes for professional development. Um, we're enjoying some of that today and there, there are some more opportunities not just this first week but also going throughout the year. Um, that is a, 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 a significant area of focus for our Board of Education and one that we're going to continue to emphasize with them. Moving forward. I think we've done a fairly good job in the last couple of years. When I say we now, I'm speaking about myself and, and, and perhaps the district administration. Articulating what needs to be done. But I'm, 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 it's also clear to me that we need to do a better job of articulating and owning the why and the how. And teachers, I think your principals in large part have done a good job of communicating what needs to be done. To the degree that they haven't, that's another conversation, but not for today. But, but I, think, I think we got the what down. Teachers, look to your administrators. Look to your administration. And administration, look to the district. For a better job of articulating and owning the why we're doing this, and the how it's to be done. The why it needs to be done and the how it is to be done. Okay, when we talk about what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, and how it needs to be done, I'd like to share um, this little clip with you. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, many of you know, perhaps, that, um, that my mother is, is a German immigrant, um, a, a, a refugee, in fact, after the, um, well, after the Second World War, but, but in, the, in the 60s was able to get out of Germany before the, the, uh, the wall went up. So in my home, in my childhood, uh, we grew up speaking German, celebrating German holidays, well, holidays on the German um, time schedule, and, and German's the first language that I heard as a child, and German's the first language that I spoke, and and so I'm sensitive to this. This really strikes home and perhaps some of you will be able to, to relate to this next clip if you haven't seen it before. Avion. Aeroplane. Aero. Avion. Flugzeug. Surprise. Surprise. Surpresa. Surpresa. Überraschung. Papillon. Butterfly. Favala. Mariposa. Schmetterling. Stilo. Pen. Pena. Plume. Kugelschreiber. Marguerite. Daisy. Margarita. Margarita. Gänseblümchen. Ambulance. Ambulance. Ambulanza. Ambulance. Yeah. Krankenwagen. Science. Science. Scienza. Scienza. Naturwissenschaften. Hippopotam. Hippopotamus. Hippopotamo. Hippopotamo. Nilpferd. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, because because people laugh really hard. I don't think it's that funny myself because it makes sense, but other people sure seem to think that's funny. So, being German by birth and upbringing myself, um, I'll, lay the, I'll, I'll put this to me, the French seem to have a different tone in the way that comes across. So, teachers, I asked your administrators to speak in French rather than in German. And, and teachers, I would ask you as you, as you work with your kids and as you work with parents, that perhaps all of us work a little harder on speaking French, if you will, and a little less, little less of the German. And I am going to work on that, going to work on that too. Let us all, in our different roles, in our various roles, be that committed communicator who leads, persuades, supports, owns and models the message genuinely, sincerely, and positively. 
Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being a part of Granite School District. I mean that sincerely. I'm grateful that you're all here working with me. Uh, we're working together to, to change the lives of the kids that the parents have sent to us. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for all you do. Let's again be the committed communicators that lead, persuade, support, own, and model the message genuinely, sincerely, and positively. I'm recommitting myself to that and hope that you'll all join me there. Thank you so very much.